It's the Q. Here is your host, Jeff Crick. Hi, Jeff Rick here with theCUBE. We are on the ground in San Jose, California at the Adobe headquarters. We're really excited to uh, interview our next guest. She is a, a, I don't know, maverick, maven. She's been in the business a lot. You <laughs> see her on air all the time. She's Jerry Martin Flickinger, CIO and SVP at Adobe. Welcome. Welcome, thank you, Jeff. So we're excited Good to be- Good job on the name, by the way. Thank you. Right. Well, Frick, Flickinger is pretty close, pretty not close. exactly. Yeah. Um, but we're down in San Jose, uh, really I think the only signature building still in downtown San Jose, the heart of Silicon Valley, and it's Adobe whose logo sticks up above everybody else. Yeah, we have three buildings. Three buildings. And we love it down here. San Jose is a wonderful city. And you have the bridge, that's the coolest part. Yep, it's so, great. So let's jump into it. Adobe's a company a lot of people probably know mm -hmm. to some degree either based on a product or from true type fonts as I look on the ground back when the, uh, the early printer days and the conversion. But you guys made a tremendous business transformation a couple years ago, yeah. moving from a classic um, license model, we all know, not inexpensive to go get that Photoshop copy or go get InDesign, but now you're in subscription. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that process and yeah. A, what motivated it, and then we can dig into a little bit about the whys yeah. and then the hows. Yeah. It's been an exciting journey at Adobe, and you mentioned a couple of our brand names, Photoshop, Acrobat, um, these products have been around for a long time. Adobe's more than 30 years old as a software company. There aren't a lot of 30-year-old software companies. Right. Um, we got to the point, though, in our delivery of product to our customers where we would be on release cycles. Every 12 months, every 18 months, everybody would run and buy the new copy of Photoshop. And we really felt the need to start releasing new features and capabilities to our customers much more quickly. You know, we were watching um, the world of consumerization occur across devices with smartphones and tablets, and we really wanted to bring our innovation to our customers more quickly. And in order to do that, you really have to stop the model of, I'm going to build software, and I'm going to put it on a golden master, and I'm going to ship it to distribution, and I'm going to put it in boxes, and I'm going to sell it all over the world. Right. That takes too long. Right. And so we said, what if we just take it right to the consumer? What if we put it online? What if we make it a true services model where people subscribe to the software and that way we can give them updates all the time? And that's really what we've done. We've moved away from the model of 18 month release cycles for our major products and we moved them into a continuous life cycle that actually gives updates to our customers constantly. And because of that, we've also changed how you pay for it. So you pay for it month to month. And through that, you get all of these additional new features, which more and more are collaboration features in the cloud. So let's talk a bit about kind of how agile software development as a methodology to get things done faster. And you mentioned, right, you would work on a spec, build a product, 18 months later it ships, and I saw you in another interview, and then the engineers get to take six weeks off because they had to get it all through the distribution channels. Yeah. To really a, a method where it's build it, you know, deliver it, fix it, build it, deliver it, fix it but really taking that from a software development model now into really more the way you manage your big products and changing your big products into little products, but then actually then executing at a business level, not just a software development level. It's a very different model. It is a very different model, and I think there's two keys to success here. The first is really changing people, process, and technology to be in an agile fashion. You have to change everything from what you think a spec is for a product, right, right. to what you think a release cycle is, to what you think QA is, to what you think customer feedback is. And the idea of having DevOps teams, which we you know, know a lot of people do, right, of course, right. right Agile, is one of the ways you can get there. Um, but at some point as you're on this journey, the second thing I would say that's very important is to think about what can become shared platform components. You know, you want people to be agile and rapid on all the stuff that's a secret sauce. You want them that next cool feature in Photoshop, that's what you want to have agile. How to run a server is not. How to keep a network up is not. There's probably even some common pieces of code component that can be shared and don't have to run and constantly be updated in an agile sprint. And so I think the second um, secret to our success is that we've thought very clearly about which things become part of the platform and get leveraged across all of the SaaS offerings right. as opposed to letting every single team build everything through the entire stack. Right. Right. Um, and that's really important and that's part of what I've done is in my role as CIO and how IT is really engaged in product at right. Adobe. And you couldn't do that when everyone has their own independent 
software component because I might miss out on the uh, on that common piece because I've only got two of the three pieces or I got one of the pieces. But now by having a creative suite concept, now I know that I can get the common components as well as the specialized ones that I use all the time. Right, and one of the, I think the most um, specific examples that make it really clear to people is common identity. You know, you want to be able to log on to your product once and have access to Photoshop and InDesign and all your other products and know that when you store something there, you can get to it from all the products. That would be an example of a shared platform component right. that all the products can engage with and it makes the customer much happier because right. they just get one unified experience. So then talk about cloud. I mean, you, you just hinted on this a little bit about cloud. Mm -hmm. And cloud both is an enabling platform, cloud is a go-to-market platform, cloud is a way to really enable you guys to transform your business. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to think about cloud differently depending on what hat you're wearing. You know, when we think about it from a financial perspective, it means our back office has to deal with billing systems that now deal with usage monitoring and understanding how much of something people have consumed. It has to deal with the concept that maybe we allow you to share with your friends and family for free, but for pay you have to have a different kind of relationship. We have to deal with the concept of licenses to major corporations that may have 50,000 named users, and that's very different than selling to to um, a housewife or a, a dad who's doing pictures for his, his kids' ball league. Right, right. So we really have to think about the go-to-market and the back office operation very differently. And that's required us to rethink our billing, our customer master, our pricing models, even the concept of a SKU, you know, right, a, right. A, which most people use to set price and, and track how much of something you right. sell has to change in this model. Well, I saw another interview that you did before, which I thought was really interesting to follow up on that, where you talked about the concept of a SKU and distribution and channels and units and inventory, and now really flipping that on a, on a recurring revenue basis and a subscription model into really it's an engagement now. You're really managing a relationship exactly. and an engagement. Talk a little bit about yep. more about that. Yep. You know, when I first started in the software business, and I've been a CIO in three software companies over, I don't know, 15 years or so, um, it used to be that when you started getting close to the end of a quarter, everybody got in a room and you simply talked about the inventory. How much inventory do we have in channel? What do we have to do for sell through? How can we you know, push, push our product all the way through to the end user? Well, today we don't have any of those conversations. They don't exist. What we do is we look at a dashboard every morning and we understand what's happening in real time with our customers. Who's, who's stayed on the subscription? Who upgraded their subscription? And unfortunately, who's left their subscription overnight? And it's a continuous quarter end. You know, the quarter end cycle is still, of course, a important aspect of our financial management as a company. But to be honest, we watch our numbers every single day now right. in a very real way. Right. Incredibly different, which means everything has to be instrumented for that online right now business, which if you're building a company from the ground up, might not seem so overwhelming, but when you've got a $4 billion business in the air right. and you have to switch in mid-flight, it's pretty dramatic. So we've been talking for a few minutes, and you're a CIO, and we haven't talked about really the technology you're turning the lights on. We've been talking a lot about a business model, and this yeah. this is consistent with a trend that we see over and over, and we hear about. And I'd love to get your your thoughts on it, because, like you said, you've been a, a CIO at a number of companies for a number of years. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about how the role of the CIO is changing, yeah. both in the course of there's a never-ending flow of interesting new technologies, and you have mobile and social and cloud and big data, et cetera, et cetera. But more importantly, the role of technology in delivering the business value as opposed to just kind of keeping the lights on and, and turning on new systems. How has that changed? Yeah, well, I think it's changed a lot. Uh, when I first started in the industry, which was a very long time ago, there was usually a room of people who knew about how the computers worked, <laughs> right? And there was another room of people who knew how the network worked, and they were pretty sacred. If you think about today, most of us are consumers of technology, and most of us are fairly intelligent consumers of technology. I work at a software company, there are 12,000 really smart technologists here. So the day of the IT department being the only smart technologist in the company who could make the call, I have been gone for a long time. So one of the things that I think is really important is that people recognize that. There's a lot of people in IT who still haven't quite figured out that probably the guy or gal down the hall is as smart as they are and as current as they are in a whole lot of technologies. Which brings me to my first point that I think is really different today. I think a CIO or an IT leader today has to be incredibly collaborative. I think it's about hearing great ideas, but remembering great ideas could come from anywhere. They don't just come from the IT department. Um, and figuring out that, that part of that collaboration um, group that you have is also people outside your company. It includes the small venture firms that are starting up 
uh, with startups around the country that you want to hear their fresh ideas from. It starts with some of your biggest suppliers like, I don't know, AT&T, who you've done business with for years, but you also need to tap in to find out what they're thinking about the next generation. It starts with your own employees. What do they know that's cool, that's hot, that they've heard about? Right, right. And really collaborating, more than just holding that nice business meeting where everybody goes away with a win-win, it's really about listening for great ideas anywhere and allowing the freedom for people to build on those great ideas. Yeah. And I think that's incredibly important. I mean, I think there's the other things that are, are fairly obvious. I think a CIO today has to have a business acumen for the industry they're in um, and a passion for that because right. you aren't going to be a standalone entity. You're going to be integrated with the business. I spend a lot of time with our customers, our real end customers right. who buy Adobe product. And I do that so that I can have a better understanding of the value we play in their supply chain. How do we bring value with Adobe product to say, um, you know, Fox News? How, how does that work? Right. And by understanding that better, I can do a better job coming into the company and ensuring our internal customers have what they need to be successful. And then talk a little bit about, you talk about uh, ideas coming from outside, kind of the whole consumerization of IT trend mm -hmm. and how that's impacting you guys. Because it used to be, you know, the big companies had the best software, you know, the enterprise stuff was the best, but now everyone's walking around with mobile phones and, and you know, the expected behavior of applications based on their interaction with Amazon and Google and Yahoo. This has really changed what people expect, especially with younger folks coming up. How has that impacted the way you guys deliver product and the way you think about things like UI and UX? Yeah, so you know, starting quite some time ago, probably seven, eight years ago, um, in the world of IT, I certainly started thinking about user experience as a very separate layer in our platform stack. And I think if you go to most IT departments today, you'll hear a very similar thing. Most of us have figured out that the consumerized user experience layer is what engages people. It's the way it looks, it's the way it interacts when you touch a button. It's that user experience. The reality is that user experience may have no relationship per se to the technology at the very bottom serving up the data. It's how you hook those things together that can make it a wonderful experience or a bad experience. So I, I think one thing that's very different and people need to all really spend time thinking about is those most successful products we've seen in the last few years have started from the user experience design and then worked to the back office, right, as right. opposed to working from the back office up. Right. You know, um, if you look at a typical ERP um, screen, user experience screen from say the late 1990s, it would be horrific as a user experience today comparing it to a right. tablet-based application. And that just shows how far user experience expectations have, have moved. It doesn't mean you have to blow up everything lower in the stack though. And that's where I think the power comes from IT departments that are thinking differently. They're working on how do we build a user experience layer that truly engages our customers. Right. But how do we do it in a way that actually leverages all those legacy assets we have that are simply too expensive to take out right, right away, or maybe they're actually really good at what they do. Right, you right. know, like a billing system that's really good is just really good at, you know, spitting out invoices. Which is important. You may not need to redo that, right? right? right. But you probably do want it to look differently. Right. So I think the idea of user experience becoming the secret sauce, as opposed to the back office being the secret sauce, is a really fundamental part of this right. transformation. Well, and certainly Apple showed, you know, the power of what good user design is still a phone, but, you know, they changed the game with that, with the iP uh, iPads, et cetera. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about you. You came on our radar really as part of our Women in Tech series and we're psyched you know, to, to talk to another really senior woman here in the Valley that's doing good things. Tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you get here? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of women in technology, <laughs> for sure. We talked to a lot of them. Yep, for <laughs> sure. Um, well, I started off with a lot of interest in math. So mathematics was kind of my my thing in high school um, and college. Okay. I have a degree in computer science and mathematics. Um, and I started off, I was lucky enough when I was in high school to be one of those schools that got a computer. And at the time, and this is funny now, but it was really unusual to have a personal computer in the classroom at all. So I had a Trash 80. Right. I don't right. know if you remember what that was. Absolutely. TR Tandy, come on. TRS, we love Tandy. TRS 80, right? <laughs> couldn't fit the Vax in the room, right? Yeah, right? Oh, those are hot. Those were crazy. So I taught myself to program, you know, during, um, lunch and breaks in high school and then went into college uh, pretty pretty typical experience got a degree got hired by Chevron oil um, worked there for a long time I did some AI work there um, did a lot of automation work there and then uh, left Chevron after 12 years to become the CIO of McAfee okay. and continued on that journey so I you know I 
I don't know. I've never really thought much about being a woman. I just focused on doing a great job and, right. and focusing on what I loved. Right. And always like kind of in the CIO role, role correct? Always in the CIO role. After I left Chevron, I was a CIO at McAfee. After that, I was a CIO at VeriSign okay. and now the CIO at Adobe. Okay. So I'll give you a chance to, to give some advice to families out there for people that want to get a career in tech. I think it's, for here in the Valley, I think pretty much most people's moms and dads probably work in the industry or a large percentage. Yeah. But for people that don't live here in the Valley and, and aren't really part of it, kind of what, what would you give for advice for people thinking of, I want to I want to go this way, I want to do what Jerry does. What should they think about? How should they, how should they proceed down their yeah. journey? Well, I, I think the first piece of advice I give everybody is you have to do what you love. Because if you don't really love whatever career you choose, you won't have the passion you need to get through the hard spots. Mm. So if you don't really love technology and love solving people problems and love dealing with the, the challenges of aligning people and efforts and dealing with tough news and happy news, you're probably not the right person to be in high tech leadership. Um, so do what you love. I think the next thing is find some mentors. You know, I think mentors have been really important to most people and those that doesn't mean sign up for a formal mentor program. It just right. means find those few professionals or peers or friends who will give you good advice and let them tell you those things that aren't working for you. Like if they can watch you and observe you and say, you know, that thing you did in that last meeting did not work. Right. Right. Um, that is the way to grow right. in your career, no matter what your career is. Um, I was lucky enough early on to actually have some amazing mentors who happened to be people that worked for me, who were never shy about walking in after me and telling me exactly what they thought I did. That work. worked for you? That worked for me. Oh, okay. And to this day, I've stayed in touch with uh, those folks, and most of them have gone on to have very, very, very successful careers themselves. So I, you know, I just, Listen for the feedback wherever right. it comes from. Right. It's going to help you. Right. That, that's really a great tip. We don't hear that very often, but you know, good feedback, good insight, good uh, information can come from any. You know, can support your earlier anywhere. statement, right? Can come from anywhere. Yep. Be ready for it. Awesome. Well, Jerry, thanks for spending a few minutes with us here. Thank you. Um, give you the last word. If we come back a year from now, what's new and exciting at, at Adobe that we'll uh, we'll be talking about? Gonna have to come back and find out. <laughs> Shoot, I thought we'd get some uh, little tips, but they're a public company; they can't tell us anything. Well, thanks again, <laughs> See Jerry. You next year. All right, so I'm Jeff Frick. We are on the ground here at the Adobe headquarters. Um, you're watching the Cube. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.